So th this is a, it's always a strange moment when, when a student defends because uh, on one side it's kind of sad because you know a student is kind of part of you know of, of, of a family you know that, that you have built over over several years and it's really sad when, when a student goes because it you know the lab changes you no know? everything everything changes and that's especially true with David uh, but it's also you know fun because you, you see the student going out and becoming independent and, and doing their thing and so on. But of course, David has been independent already for several years. This is not changing now. And actually, I would like to know from the family members, but I'm pretty sure he was born independent already. Um, so David has always been uh, a, you know, one of a kind. And when he arrived to the lab, uh, he arrived with a mission. He already knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to be able to understand neural networks and to piece them apart and to build modules so that anyone could start hacking them, like if you were playing with your Lego toys. And that was his mission. And he came to my office and he said, you know, this is what I want to do. Which lab do you think I should go? And I say, you should go to my lab. And then I didn't let him get out of the office and, until he signed a paper where you know, he committed the, the next five years of his life to be working with me. So that was, you know, that was great. And, and I'm so happy that he decided to, you know, to, to listen to my, my threats and, and really be part of, of, of the lab. And you know, David has done so many crazy things. Uh, despite of, you know, besides of the research, research, there has been a lot of things that he has done. He has actually written a book. Uh, in fact, you know, I found the link in Amazon. You can find it here. I just copied it on the, on the chat. And he wrote a book on numerical algebra, which, by the way, is kind of expensive, David. So you should probably do something about that. But, um, but if, if any of you is curious about it, you, there is a copy in the, in the open area on the third floor of C cell that you, know, you can... You can you can look at, and he wrote this while he was, I don't know when, a student on, on listening to a class and just took, took notes and, and transformed the notes into a book. So he actually also, you know, bought a lot of tiles, like bathroom tiles, colorful tiles. Uh, I don't know how many, how many hundreds of them, like boxes of them that are right to the lab, and we use them to create a mosaic that we have over there. So you, you go to the open area on the third floor, you will see the result of all of the tiles that David bought. So, so he's, he's been like a, a really important piece of the lab. He's been a lab on his own. Uh, he has uh, advised so many students and, and done an amazing work. And the good news is that we are not losing him. He actually is starting a job as faculty in a year uh, at Northeastern. So he's going to be in the neighborhood and you know, we'll continue collaborating and I encourage all of you to continue working with him and to you know, benefit from, 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 from all the things that he does. So it's just been amazing. And you know, I don't wanna take more time. So David, the floor is yours. Great, am I, am I unmuted? Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, it, it's such a kind, kind introduction. Um, let me uh, put my, my slides up here and you can give me a thumbs up if you can, are you able to see it? Did I, I, I'm afraid I didn't share the right one. Let me try again. Here we go. Now, now is that, maybe that's the right one. Okay, great. So um, yeah, it's really wonderful to be here today, even if it's virtual, uh, you know, looking out in the audience over the last couple of minutes, I see so many friends from over the years, many friends from, before my time at MIT and many people I've met here, I see some new faces too. You know, the nice thing about being virtual is that people can join far away. Uh, so I'm really happy that my in-laws are here from, uh, from Hawaii. Uh, I see uh, my master's degree advisor, Nick Trefethen from England uh, has joined us. And I, I haven't figured out what time it is in that time zone, but thank you so much for joining me here today. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about my research. Um, I'm going to take first a moment to introduce myself uh, to people who don't know everything about where my perspective comes from. So, you know, I was an undergrad ages ago, math major at Harvard, and I got a master's at Cornell where I wrote that book uh, with Nick Trefethen, 
who is my advisor in numerical analysis there. Um, then I went to work in industry and I built a lot of systems as, in industry as a software engineer, Microsoft and startups and Google. And so as a software engineer, I really learned how complex software can be, but also how valuable it can be to understand that complex software. And so when I came back to school here at MIT, uh, that's kind of been my theme. I've been studying um, you know, complex, the complexity of neural networks uh, with Antonio Taralba. And uh, I'll never forget Antonio's first comment to me. Uh, he, I think he remembers that discussion in the office as well. I remember it very clearly as well. And, but what, what, what sticks with me is after I described my research ideas to the first time to me, he looked at me right in the eye and he said, I think you can do it. And actually, you know, I think that was his first lesson to me, and it's maybe the most important. And the message behind that is really, you need to hold on tight to your optimism. Because if you don't, you know, you're never going to figure out how to do the hard things to answer the hard questions and make it really work. And so I'll always be grateful for Antonio's wisdom and his creativity, his optimism, and his support. And on that note, I'm proud to, you, proud to present to you my defense. Um, the title is Dissection of Deep Neural Networks. And the goal is to understand and control AI. Now, it's a simple goal. Uh, we wanna enable people to understand and control machine learned systems, just like we can understand and control traditional software. Now, the reason this is such an important problem is that in the last decade, we're starting to be able to make AI systems that really work. Um, in fact, this new kind of programming is becoming quite routine. If you have a program that you, if you need a program to deal with images or natural language or other complex data, this used to be a super difficult problem, but now I can just go to GitHub and download all sorts of deep networks to do it. So this one is PyTorch StyleGAN 2 ADA. It's a generative model. And to program it, all I do is show it some data, like these pictures of birds. And then I train it. I can use GPUs. It could take a few days. But at the end, I get a program, a trained network. And so this network happens to be a computational model for drawing pictures of birds. Um, the program I get is conceptually simple. It's just a function. Uh, if you input a random vector, it does a bunch of arithmetic, and then it outputs a random realistic bird. Um, so this, this style GAN uh, will output a different realistic bird for every different input that I give it. Um, it's called an unconditional model, which means it's just trained to draw random birds. So it kind of leads to the question, how do you control a model like this? Like, what if I wanted a specific kind of bird? What if I wanted a flying yellow bird, right? Well, there are two approaches that you can take to controlling a deep network. And one is to treat it like a black box. And uh, when you do this, you can still steer it, but you steer it from the outside. And we can do this by engineering objectives, goals for the network to follow. The second is to crack open the black box and control it from the inside. Now, the first method is the ordinary way we deal with deep networks. And I'm gonna get into one example, a piece of recent work we've done with this classical approach, uh, because I'm gonna use it as an example of the limitations of this approach, which leads to the second idea, which is really what my thesis is about. Um, so suppose I wanna edit this bird to make it look different. So for example, let's say I wanna transform this image from a little blue bird to a photo of a yellow bird flying in the sky. So let me show you how to do it without cracking open any black boxes. Um, I can start with my style GAN trained to generate birds. So here it's generating the little blue one. Then I can take a second network to guide the generator. So to do that, I'm actually gonna download the OpenAI Clip network. And this is another big network and it's capable of scoring the similarity between any piece of text and any image. And now, so this image doesn't really match the description very well. So CLIP gives it a pretty low score, but we can use that score. We can use the score as an optimization target and search for changes in Z 
they improve the match. And if I use a good robust optimizer, uh, you know, I use CMA, then we can actually make the bird look more like the text. And you can ask, well, it worked for this image. How well does it work in general? Uh, here's some examples. Uh, I've put our simple two network method at the bottom. At the top is a previous state of the art of this well-studied problem going from images to text. That's the DALI method. And if you look at the examples, our method works pretty well. It stands up. And if you do a quantitative study, if you uh, do a human evaluation um, and ask people, you know, what matches the text better? What looks more realistic? You know, our method does pretty well, actually. Um, does better than the Dolly method on the specific domain of birds. Um, so it seems like we're doing okay. It seems like we can actually control our model by doing nothing but plugging it together with another huge model, right? So this is the current state of the art of deep networks. It's emblematic of this approach. And I think it's great fun, but I also think it obscures the big problem which is that in all of this, we have no idea how it actually works. We don't know what the generator is doing. We don't know what the similarity network is doing. And this ignorance can hide some problems. So for example, here's a really simple motivating example. Let's say we wanna take a photo of a room and let a person say how they wanna change it. Like let's say they wanna make the bed green. So if you use our method, you get a result like this. You know, the bed, is green, it's great, but look what happened. The walls turn green too, and that's not something we asked for. So we experimented with letting the user paint an area and change the objective so that it penalizes changes outside the area you want to change. And when you do that, even when you do that, the results look like this, green walls. And so while you think, well, maybe the clip model doesn't understand language that well, Maybe asking for green makes it want to see the whole room as green. So, so we hid the area outside the bed from a clip like this, and we tried it again, but it also doesn't fix the problem, you know, green walls. So what's happening is we can't solve the problem by treating our generator as a black box. The generator is really opinionated. It thinks the walls have to match the sheets. It doesn't do anything we want. It has its own rules, its own concepts. But until we run into them, we don't know what they are. And so I want you to think about how different this process is from how a human draws an image. So what I've shown you here is one of the first drawings done by a four-year-old girl. Um, her preferred subject is horses. Now compare her horse to the output of a state-of-the-art style GAN network. So obviously Heidi's picture here is very simple, but it reveals a logical structure that's not obvious in the network's output. Now, Heidi obviously sees that a horse is made of parts. It has a head, it has a tail, it has some legs. If you told Heidi her horse doesn't seem to have enough legs, she could easily fix that problem. This one has seven legs. And if you told Heidi, this horse should wear some clothes, she can do that too. This one has pants. So on the other hand, with StyleGAN, you look at the images and it makes you wonder, does the network even know that a horse has legs? There's no obvious structure or there's no way to control the legs or change anything. And so that brings us to the fundamental theme of the talk, which is the question of whether neural networks actually contain concepts. So my dissertation goes over several sets of experiments to investigate this question. If we have time, I'm gonna talk about three of those um, uh, sets of experiments today. First, I'm gonna talk about dissecting the neurons of a classifier. Then, uh, motivated by the question of causality, I'm gonna turn our attention to generative models. And then finally, I'm gonna ask about relationships. How are rules and relationships between concepts represented in a model. And so let's dive in. So the first question is whether we can find concepts inside a classifier. So the traditional way to know what a deep net learns is you just train it on a data set, like these pictures of places, where we hold out some test data that we keep secret. This is a classifier that learns to tell the difference between 365 classes of places, like markets and pastures. So after the network, 
learns to make predictions by minimizing its loss on the training set, we can test it. We can test its accuracy on the secret holdout set. And so this network does pretty well on the secret test, which means the network must have learned the abstract concepts we had in mind, right? But scoring well on a test like this, you know, it, it proves something, but it's kind of dissatisfying because what we really want to know is why? Why did the network say this is a pasture, right? What did the network actually see here? Does it just look at the whole image and suddenly decide pasture, right? This problem of understanding a deep network has gotten some attention, but it's not easy because the fundamental problem is that a deep network is complex. For example, this VGG classifier does 19 billion pieces of arithmetic to make one prediction, right? What are all these calculations doing? So there's a couple dominant approaches for understanding a deep network. So one response to the complexity is to find a simpler surrogate model that imitates the network. People have looked at using linear models, decision trees, nearest neighbor models, uh, even uh, finite state machines. So the main problem with surrogate models is that this second model that we introduce, it might behave differently from the original network. And so we're more interested in studying the original network itself. What is its original actual structure? So the other popular method is to ask about input sensitivity. For example, you could try masking out parts of the image to see which parts make the most difference to the network. Um, let me show you one example. You could make a heat map like this to highlight the important parts. And so there are a lot of ways to make saliency heat maps. This is a partial list of citations. Uh, you can use gradients or optimization or masking. This heat map I'm showing you here happens to be a grad cam heat map. It tells us where the network is looking. Now, the problem with heat maps is although they show us where the network looks, it doesn't really tell us why. It doesn't tell us why the network is looking there or what what the network is looking for. And so that's what we want to know. Is the network looking for trees? Is it looking for grass? Uh, so there's an old classic idea from neuroscience that we're going to use for inspiration. And that idea is that everything you perceive is just due to the computations of some neuron in your brain. So for example, does it, when we ask, does the network perceive trees, we could start by asking, is there a neuron for the concept of trees. So let me show you how we can look for concept neurons. Uh, we pick a neuron and we see how it activates when we show an image. So this is a convolutional network, which means we can create a heat map that shows where a neuron is active throughout the image. Uh, so the red bar down here means that this unit is firing in the lower right part of the image. Uh, it looks like it's responding to some colors, some animals in the grass, um, and then um, and, 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 you know, and then this is just one example. Uh, to get a more systematic idea of what this neuron is doing, we can test it on more images. So let me show you another similar image with this one. Now, here the heat map is all black. It means that the neuron doesn't really activate on this one. Uh, here's an image with lots of stuff in it. Uh, the neuron is still silent here. And so this is actually pretty typical. Most neurons are silent most of the time. Uh, you need to try a lot of uh, inputs to see what causes it to activate. Uh, so here's a very, very dark image. It's maybe, I'm not sure if you can see what's in it. It's actually a dark image of a horse uh, indoors, but it did cause this neuron to activate, right? It's, it's, it, it, it liked this picture. Um, here's another one uh, that activates the neuron. It activates in two areas. Notice it seems to be responding to where these horses are. So it leads to this question, could this be a neuron for detecting horses? And so to quantify and scale this kind of search for concept neurons, I assembled a data set called Broden. And the idea of Broden is to have images where we label a lot of different visual concepts. Uh, concepts like horses or flowers, um, bigger concepts like streets, uh, or smaller concepts like headboards or wheels, parts of objects, materials like wood or metal, or just abstract textures like stripes and squirrels. So we have lots of example images of each visual concept. 
And we can use them to see if neurons activate on them. So in total, these are more than 60,000 images with more than 1,000 visual concepts labeled. And I'll show you how to use this to quantify how well a neuron activates um, on a concept like horses. So since in Broden, we've labeled exactly where the horses are, we can just run the Broden images and check to see if the neuron agrees with the annotations. And we can do this on all the images. And it gives us some data that we can use to score the quality of the match. So I use a ratio called IOU. Um, a perfect match would be 1.0. And you know this neuron is not perfect, but it's pretty good. It locates horses better than it matches any other concept. Uh, and you can see examples of its top activations here. Uh, the reason that it's surprising that it does so well at matching horses and why it's so interesting is because we did not explicitly teach this neural network about horses. So at the bottom, I'll show you the uh, training task. These are the place classes that the network was trained on and what it's predicting each one of these scenes to be. And as you can see, this horse neuron that we have, it fires on all these different classes. It is not selective for any one class. What it is selective for is horses. And it's not the only neuron that detects something interesting like this. We have um, a unit for food. We have a unit for cars. Uh, by testing all the neurons against the concepts, we can make a report. And so here's the report for all the neurons in a VGG classifier and what they detect. So this full report actually scrolls down for many pages. It's more than I can show on one slide, but there's one neuron per block. So you see there's a wheel neuron, a cat neuron, uh, skyscrapers, dogs, dots, mountains, and so on. And at the top is a bar graph summarizing all the neurons in a layer. So every column is one detected concept, and the height of each bar is the number of neurons that match the concept. So immediately, this kind of report lets us answer some, some fundamental questions. For example, is there just one neuron for a concept? And the answer is no. There are a lot of concepts that have multiple neurons. For example, there are several airplane neurons. There are several car neurons, right? You can also ask other questions about the network, like what concepts are with layers? So here we see concepts in the layers going from simple to complex. On early layers, you get things like colors and textures. And at late layers, you have these complex objects that appear. You can also ask, how do concepts appear during training? So at the beginning, when you have a random network, none of the neurons really detect anything interesting at all. But they start to find concepts around 10,000 iterations of training and they get better and better. As you go along, you can ask how do different network architectures compare? You can ask what's the effect of regularizers on concept learning? But there's a fundamental question that is my favorite. I think it's actually the most important one. Uh, so, um, and what that is, is the question of, do neurons really represent concepts or are we just reading random correlations? Right. At one level, we do know that neurons are much better at matching concepts than random because we saw that at the beginning of training, when we start with a random neural network, there's no agreement at all between random neurons and human understandable concepts. But there's another major hypothesis out there, which is that concepts are learned by a layer of a network as a whole and not by individual neurons. Neurons could just be finding concepts because they're just a random basis for this layer feature vector space. So now we have this quantitative way of looking at how well neurons select for objects. So we can test this directly and quantitatively. So what we do is we form several random bases of the same feature vector space, and we test them for concepts. And we do this in a way that doesn't change the accuracy of the network at all. And so the results are shown here. At the top are the concepts learned by the actual neurons in the neural network as we trained it. And at the bottom are concepts matched by an arbitrary basis vector in a totally equivalent layer uh, that didn't come out of our training process. An arbitrary basis finds far fewer human understandable concepts than the actual neurons learned by the network. And so my conclusion looking at this is that individual neurons do converge towards human concepts. Even though they're imperfect at this, the effects we see are not just random. 
And so, uh, so th that's one of the big takeaways. The big takeaways I've summarized here, the conclusion, the big conclusion is that concept neurons do appear. When we look at them qualitatively, they're remarkably se selective. When we look at them quantitatively, they outperform baselines at matching human understandable concepts. Okay, so I was very excited about this. And when we published these results, of course, there's some people who asked, is there really value? Is there really value here at looking at individual neurons? Um, and here, the big underlying question is really, so what, right? Even if neurons correlate with really interesting concepts, does that mean that you can do anything with that knowledge? Does that mean that we even know what these concept neurons are for? So that purpose question is really a causality question. Uh, not a question about causality in the real world, but a simpler question about causality within the neural network. What effect will it have if I remove the neuron for horse? Well, so it turns out in a classifier has a very specific effect on a few classes. I'll show you that quickly. Um, for example, here's a mysterious prediction. You know, we looked at this class pastures. So to quantify the role of an individual neuron in how the network classifies pastures, we can remove units one by one. We can ask how important is the horse unit to this class? And so if we remove the horse unit, the accuracy on pastures decreases more than 8%. The field unit here, this detector for fields, decreases it by 3.7%. Uh, um, you know, there's a unit for grass that also decreases it by 3.7%. These three units out of the hundreds of units in the network actually are the most important for this class. They decrease the accuracy of the pasture classification the most when you remove them. And you can understand how many units are important to a class by removing all these units at once. It reduces the accuracy even more. And we can repeat this process for more units. So here, I'll graph how accuracy of a class is affected when we remove the most important units altogether. After about 20 units removed, accuracy is down to near random. So I don't need to kill the other 492 units in the network, the network has already pretty much forgotten about the class after I remove 20 units. And this is just one example of a class, the sparse structure is seen across all the output classes. So here I've graphed single class accuracy for all 365 classes of the network. Each class is a green dot, has its own accuracy. Uh, if I kill the 20 most important units for each class, the accuracy drops severely in every case down to near random. Uh, so every experiment here is a blue dot and you can see that for every one of these classes, there's just a handful of concept neurons that seem essential for the class. And so when you ask, what's the purpose of a horse neuron? You can think of it as being important for recognizing pastures and a few other classes. But still, there's something dissatisfying about this. It doesn't really cut to the core question we have, which is, is this neuron really how the network is seeing horses? Accuracy on pastures is like circumstantial evidence. And what I wanna know is something more direct. Oh, we have a question from one of my readers, so I must pause. I'm sorry for that's okay pull, pull, pulling rank here. I just actually like uh, about the previous slide. Mm -hmm. So when you say you remove the neuron, what does it exactly mean? It's it's very simple. So all I do is so you know the neural network work is just a program, and we can run it normally and allow it to compute um, the output of every norm neuron in the normal way, or we can intervene in it. And so at the moment when it computes whatever neuron is going to output, we can interrupt the computation and substitute the number zero instead. And so in these networks, the number zero is you know usually pretty meaningful because uh, we use what's called the ReLU nonlinearity, which means that these neurons um, are actually zero most of the time. And so when we, when we force a network to zero, even if the network would have normally um, computed a large number, uh, the network you know, can still do a reasonable computation. The, ac the overall accuracy of the network um, is still pretty good. We've just like targeted certain uh, classes and damaged them when we, when we uh, turn off individual neurons like this. There's another question. Hi, my name is Jidwan. Uh, thanks for taking that question. So uh, in, on this same slide, what did you mean by most important? Yes, it's very simple. So what we do is, so I, I started off with a simple single neuron test. So for every um, neuron, I turn it off and I ask which output classes does it affect the most? And if I go to an output class and I rank the neurons by the ones that would damage that class accuracy the most, I call that 
uh, an importance ranking. Um, and so I just rank all of the neurons according to how important they are for a class. But now that only tests the neurons individually. And so what I do here is I say, okay, what happens if I take the 20 most important neurons and turn them off all at once? And it turns out that in almost all cases, that's enough to pretty much cause a network to be ignorant of that class. And there's other experiments that are like this, and we've written them up uh, in, in, a, in an article at, in PNA. It's called the um, Understanding the Role of, uh, of, of an Individual Neuron in a Network or something. I forgot exactly the title, but I'll, I'll have some citations at the, end of the, um, at the end of the talk, and I can share the slides so you can find the full study. Um, so I, I want to uh, you know, make this point. Let me, before I show this, I want to make this point that you know, the real question we have is really about what the network is seeing with this neuron, right? This circumstantial evidence about class accuracy um, is a little dissatisfying because I wanna know something more direct. Like if I were to stimulate this neuron, would it make the network see a horse? When I turn this neuron off, is it like blind to horses? And it seems like a really odd question to ask, what is this network actually perceiving um, and I'm sure it seemed odd in biological neuroscience as well, but when this exact question came up in biology, they were able to test it in humans. Uh, and so I took uh, Nancy Canwisher's class as part of my requirements here as PhD, and I will never forget this video. Um, this came from a 2017 study by Schock, uh, where Japanese researchers directly stimulated face-selective neurons in a surgery patient. Uh, to test the causal effects, this is what they did. They just asked the patient to look at a blank box and describe what they saw. And the result was, when they stimulated the neurons, the patient directly perceived high-level visual concepts like eyes and a mouth. And to me, this is strong, direct evidence that the neurons have this causal purpose. They cause you to perceive a visual concept. It's not just a correlation. Uh, so the question is, can we do this? Can we ask this question in a deep network too? Um, so we can't ask a classifier to talk about what it sees, but there are networks whose job it is to draw what they think. And those are the generative models, like the one that I showed at the beginning of the talk. So that brings us to the second part, which is dissecting a, a generator, dissecting a generator. Uh, so, we, so the generative models are just neural networks. Again, we can look at the neurons of a generator. Um, this one happens to be trained to generate scenes with churches. And so when renders a picture like this, it's really natural to ask, are there neurons for objects like trees or towers or doors? Um, and we can test them using dissection, looking at one neuron at a time. So this neuron uh, seems to be activating in the lower left when the network generates this image, sort of where the tree is. And we can quantify that by analyzing it systematically on lots of images. Now, this time we can't use Broden because the GAN is making its own images. It doesn't take images as input. So instead, what I did is I use a computer vision model uh, to segment the images into objects and identify where things like trees are in the output and score the neurons to see which ones match the objects well. And so when you do that, um, and measured over a large sample of images and test every neuron and every concept in a large vocabulary, what do you find? Well, we find lots of neurons that match objects. We find neurons for trees, more than one. Uh, we find neurons for parts of buildings like domes. We find neurons for objects like doors and grass. If you take other types of complex scenes and you train a network on say kitchens, then you find neurons that corresponds, uh, correspond to things in a kitchen, like ovens or parts of chairs, or some neurons for materials or colors, like red. So this plot summarizes the different visual concepts that appear in a layer of a generator. Um, and this one uh, maps out all the layers of the network like this. So as you can see, a lot of the object and part neurons emerge in the middle layers of the generator this is a different picture than we saw in classifiers um, where the, the high level concepts really appeared at the edge of the network instead of the middle. So it's quite interesting that it's different. So now that we've made this map, um, 
and we have identified neurons that correlate with different concepts, we can test the causality question. Uh, like what happens to what the network is doing with the scene if we turn off tree neurons, right? So here we've measured the effect. Uh, and there are several tree neurons and I can turn off more and more of them. And the more I turn off, the fewer trees there are. Turning off just five neurons is enough to control about half the trees in the model. And I can control more than half if I turn off more, but there's some limit. As we increase the number of neurons we turn off, uh, even with about 25 neurons removed, there's still some trees that remain. So we see similar causality and similar limitations with windows and chairs and domes and other objects in the model. Um, but the interesting thing, besides just this measurement of causality, is what happens when you actually look at the images. So I want to show you um, some, some actual images of removing the tree neurons. And you can see uh, the interesting things that happen. So yes, uh, when I turn off tree neurons, the trees go away. But I want you to observe this occlusion effect, because now that the trees are gone, the network is drawing other things. You can see the building parts that used to be obscured by the tree. And so this is actually really striking, right? Because the generator was just trained on this task of painting realistic scenes by looking at visible pixels. But it's not just learning about visible pixels. It seems to be modeling hidden things in the world as well, like what might have been behind those trees. The network is aware of the building, even though it didn't draw it. And you can see that by turning off the tree neurons. Um, so let me show you another interesting phenomenon from just looking at these uh, effects when you turn neurons off. We found that there are neurons that seem to control errors. So if you take 20 error-causing neurons and you turn them off, then the effect is the GAN starts drawing images that look better. And it's not just that they look better. We ran statistical measures of output quality, um, a measure called FID is a standard. And when you measure that, that gets better too. So this was a real surprise. So usually it's very hard to beat an optimizer, but here it was really easy to beat training by just turning off some neurons. We don't know why a model might contain error neurons like this. Uh, this was a state-of-the-art model that was trained by the original authors of this network, uh, but it had this very clear flaw that could be fixed. Um, so uh, let me also show you that you can turn neurons on. So here, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 20 door neurons at the location of this yellow box here, and I'm going to turn them on, and we'll see what the network sees. Uh, so what do you get? Well, you get a door. Uh, so we can cause the neuron to think about doors just by stimulating a few neurons. Now, when you look at this door and notice its size and style and how it fits into the wall nicely, uh, because I'm going to show you what happens if we take exactly the same door, door neurons and activate them in a different uh, scene. So here, I'll pick this location. I'm going to turn on 20 door neurons, exactly the same ones, in exactly the same way. Uh, in this location, and you can see what happens. So I, I get a door, but this door looks totally different, right? It's much smaller. It's got a different style and color. So what that tells us is that these neurons really aren't about a literal arrangement of pixels. Somehow they're capturing the abstract idea of a door, which could look different in different places. So let me show you another trick. What do you think happens if I take exactly the same 20 door neurons and turn them on up here, up here in the sky? What do you think we'll get? Well, I'll show you. This is the output. Nothing happened. So the door neurons are sensitive to context. Think about what we've seen. When we activate door neurons in a different wall, it looks different. But if we put a door in a place that a door doesn't make sense, like in the sky, the network seems to refuse to draw it. So this refusal is a very stark effect. It's almost like a switch. And we can measure that, and quantify it. Um, so when we quantify the causal effects of 
activating neurons in different contexts, it lets us map out the ways that the generator is opinionated. It won't let a door go anywhere, um, but it does let a door go into a building, in the bottom of a building, especially in the location of existing windows, but it won't draw a door in the grass, it won't draw a door in the trees, uh, it won't draw a door in the sky. So these causal effects are pretty interesting and they're also really satisfying because it lets us use the neurons as a semantic paint. So to demo this, I made this cool app, um, made it together with my good friend, Hendrik Strobelt here. It's called GAN Paint. Uh, each button on the left selects a set of neurons and you can activate or deactivate those neurons in part of the image by painting on the right. We effectively use the network as a paintbrush. So if you like, you can actually demo this. You can try it on your phone. Uh, the URL is at the bottom, GAN Dissect. Um, and the thing I want you to notice if you play with it is how the drawing effects are sensitive to context. So for example, let's see here. If you draw a door in a different building, uh, you'll get a different looking door than if you draw a door in some building that has some different location. And you know this, this painting and this activation of neurons these causal effects, they let us answer one of our original questions, uh, which is, does our no network know that horses have legs? If we dissect each neuron in the network, we do find ones that match legs. In this network, uh, there's one unit, it's unit 278 at layer six that correlates with legs. And interestingly, it can also trigger a leg. Um, it can add a whole leg, including muscles, knee, and hoof. And so we can even use it to make a seven-legged horse, which I'll show you here. Activate this neuron in different locations of the image. So here, I'm really just activating one neuron. And you can see that this knowledge is really, you know, you can see that the network really knows something about legs on horses. It has some knowledge that you can understand by understanding its neurons. So what I've shown you is a contrast between a couple of different intellectual viewpoints. On one side, you have the mainstream deep network view. Um, you know, the deep networks are black boxes. Uh, you don't need to slice open a human brain to teach a student. So why would we slice open our deep networks? Just teach them to speak English. Right? On the other side, you have my point of view, right? which is that deep networks are not so mystical. They're not really human brains. They're just computer programs. So just like you can understand how the parts of a program work, you can understand the parts of a deep network and it'll let you do new things better. Now, there are a couple of things that we found that are really hard to grapple with if you use a network as a black box. We saw this example where the model wants to enforce correlations uh, like bed sheets that match walls or curtains in a room or where it won't let us put doors in the sky. Um, and so even though we found concept neurons and verified that they have causality and control over concepts that we want, we also found limitations in the model's ability or willingness to combine concepts in some ways, like how it won't put doors in the sky. So you can ask, how are those rules enforced and can we modify them? And that's part three of the talk, which I will run through a little quickly. So now that we understand how concepts are represented in a network, we can ask, how are relationships? and rules between concepts represented? And can we change those rules? Can we have a causal effect on them? And so I'm gonna take a look at a simple rule, which is an assumption about architectural styles. So for example, in a model of churches, this type of tower will always have pointy spires on top of it. Um, and so what if we wanted to teach a network a new rule? So for example, consider this tree growing out of the top of a tower. This is a real picture of a tree uh, growing out of the courthouse in Decatur County, Illinois. It's a very unique tree. It's one of a kind. Um, and so we can ask, what if we want a model that makes tree tower images like this? It's not the kind of thing you could normally do with AI methods because we don't have a big data set of tree towers to train on. We just have one. Uh, so how can we create a model without a data set? How could I make trees grow out of towers? So for a single image, we already know how to do this. We could just use GAN Paint or even just a regular image editor to add a tree to a tower. 
This just changes a single image. It's not the question that I'm asking. What I'm asking is, how do you change a model instead of an image? I want to take a model as input, like, again, be trained with some weights, W0, and make a changed model as output with new weights, W1. So since the model is a program to make an endless stream of images, what I'm really asking is, how do you make a modified program to make modified images that obey new rules, for example, with trees growing out of all the towers? So in our method, we're going to specify a model change in two steps. The first is to choose what part of the model to change. I call it rule selection. The second is how to change a model. I call it goal selection. And to make it really concrete, I'm going to begin by showing you an interaction in an interface, and then I'll explain to you what I'm doing. So this image viewer here on the right shows a sample of synthesized images come out of the model. This is a StyleGAN V2. It's uh, one of the latest models for generating uh, uh, realistic images. This one is trained on Elsun churches. And um, to change the model, we begin with rule selection. What we do is we choose what rule the model to change by picking examples of similar context. Let me see if I can get this animation to play here. And so what I've done is I've chosen a few towers and I've clicked on a um, little button here, which reveals other images that are affected the same rule. So effectively, I'm looking for parts of the images that are represented by the same neurons. Um, and these things are always pointy towers. Okay, that's great. Now what I wanna do is I wanna change this rule. So we'll, we let the user specify this by copy and paste. They can pick a tree in one image and paste it into another one. But when they do this, we're not just editing one image. What we're going to do is we're giving the system an example of how the rule needs to change in general. And so we can execute that change. And we do a calculation that takes about eight seconds and then make a change in the model. After the model's changed, all the pointy towers turn into trees. And so this change isn't just done in one image. It's done in all the generated towers. On the other hand, it's also just changed one rule. So you can notice that regions and unrelated images that aren't caused by this rule, they remain unchanged. So our change has generalized to an infinite set of images, but it's also really specific to the rule that we specified. And so to, to give you a little more intuition, I'm going to rewrite exactly the same rule in a different way by changing the goal. So instead of copy and pasting a tree, I can copy and paste a dome shape instead. And then now, um, if I can get my video to unblock, the pointy towers rule will become a rule to draw domes now instead of pointy towers or trees. So that's the idea. Now you've seen the idea, let me explain to you how this method works. So the method's based on a really simple linear algebra fact, which is that a single linear operation can be used as a memory. So suppose you have n vector keys. Uh, k sub i, think of them as addresses, and n vector values, v sub i, which is like data to store for each key. Well, then we could store all the values in a matrix, uh, a linear operation, by just finding the w that solves v equals wk for all pairs. Then whenever we want to look up a value, we just multiply by the matrix, and then we get the stored value out. So this is one way to think about what a single layer neural network does. If a key encodes a meaningful question, like how should a tower be drawn, then each stored value could encode an answer, like it should be pointy. So this view of a single layer neural network is not new. It's an old idea of uh, an associative memory that goes back to Cohonen and Anderson in 1972. Uh, today, we call it an, the optimal linear associative memory view of a single layer, on that, uh, single layer neural network. And it's called optimal because uh, one way of looking at it is as an error minimization problem. In the presence of error or when the problem is overconstrained, really what you want your memory to do is remember a value that is as close as possible to the stored V. So this form might look really familiar. It's just ordinarily squares. It's a convenient, well-studied, problem um, that we can actually write a solution to in, uh, in closed form here as the normal equations, uh, which have this form. So here in, in, this, in this equation down here, 
I've expressed what W0 needs to be, our, our, our memorized matrix, um, as a solution to a matrix equation where I've just gathered together all the stored keys in a big matrix K and all the stored values in a big matrix V. So this is a really handy view. Um, now, one of the things that Cajonan didn't write about is how to do updates to the memory. What if we want to add a new thing to the memory? Uh, but we can work that out. Um, and we can actually write it in another well-studied form. So the idea is we want the memory to continue to minimize error in all the previously stored memories, but we want to add a new memory. So I've written the new memory here is K star and V star. And I've written the uh, goal of what we want the new memory to do um, uh, in this form. And this form might look familiar as well. This is constrained least squares. And it also has a nice solution that can be written down as a modified normal equation in this form. And so the cool thing is if you take these two solutions and you combine them, you find that most of the terms cancel. And the new matrix with the new memory is actually equal to the old one with just a small update. And this ideal update has a really simple form you can write down. The change is a rank one update in the weights. Um, that means it's a product of two vectors. On the right is a vector that determines the direction of each row of the update, uh, C inverse little k. And that, that vector is actually fully determined by the key. It has nothing to do with the value that we wrote. Uh, C is covariance statistics over keys that we can estimate by looking at samples. Um, on the left, the lambda is what is determined by the value, and that determines the magnitude of each row of the update. So the update always slides along this direction C inverse little k, no matter what value we write. Um, the direction sort of acts like a memory slot for the key. No matter how big the change is, if we update the matrix in the specific direction, we know that we're going to minimize interference with all of the other old memories. It's almost like writing to a line of RAM. And so uh, this, is, this is the way that we're, we, you can think of a single layer neural network. What's bold about our proposal is this, is that we hypothesize that even deep inside a network with many layers, a single layer might still be acting like an optimal linear associative memory, memorizing associations between keys that encode a meaningful concept and values that define how that should be drawn. Um, and we can change one memorized value um, uh, by trying to edit a single rule. So here's how we do it. First, we calculate this ideal update direction C inverse little k, I'll call it D. Um, now, that just depends on the key we want to change and not the value. And in the UI, that is what we're doing. We ask the user to do rule selection. We ask for a few examples of similar contexts, and those give us examples of k that we average to get a good high quality key. We found that the results work better um, if you get several examples to get a good key. Then we ask the user to do a copy paste example. And what we're actually doing is we're having the user pick a value to write as a goal. And then finally, we use the key and the value to update uh, an optimized update that optimizes this goal while remaining totally constrained to this update direction D. So it's a simple method, but it allows a rule to be completely changed while allowing um, allowing a role to be completely changed while avoiding changes in unrelated things in the model. So let me show you a couple other examples here. Um, so we can change a complex model of human faces. Uh, so this model has a rule for kids' eyebrows. They tend to be very thin. And... Um, my Zoom is pausing here a little bit. But the idea is, if I take this, um, uh, the output of this model and I select a context like kids' eyebrows, uh, we can change a rule um, by picking an example of a different value that we want to store in this associative map. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste this bushy mustache to use as an example. And after I execute the change, all the kids 
have very bushy eyebrows, like bushy mustache eyebrows. Um, and so, you know, this is not an effect that we could have achieved through training. There's no data set of bushy eyebrow kids like this, right? I'll show you a couple other examples that we evaluated. Uh, to, to quantify our results, we conducted studies comparing this method to several other baselines. Some people have studied methods called edit propagation methods that really just operate on pixels rather than the interior of the model. And we compare pretty favorably to, um, to those methods. You can take a look at the details in the paper. So one of the change, challenges of uh, evaluation in a setting like this is that most of the evaluation methods are designed to measure how realistic results are. So we have to evaluate on realistic looking edits, like changing a dome to some other realistic looking shape, like uh, a pointy spire. Uh, or changing a face in a realistic way, like making everybody smile. Um, but, you know, I think that the really interesting thing about this is that we can also help a user achieve fantastical results that aren't necessarily realistic. And you know, we can allow a person to create a model that doesn't just mimic some training data, but which is based on some new idea that the user has imagined that doesn't necessarily exist yet in the world. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you got this crazy idea that maybe horses should wear pants. I could select a few horse legs here, find an update direction, and then find some pants somewhere like these jeans that somebody's wearing and execute a change in how horse legs are represented. And now the horses are wearing jeans. Um, and this is, you know, this is something that our four-year-old Heidi could have done. What we've seen is that we can achieve similar levels of control that a four-year-old child can have on her drawings, right? And the key has been to understand the structure of the network. By understanding how data is represented, we've been able to use that understanding to do things like adding new legs to a horse. And by understanding how rules are represented, we can use that understanding to redefine the rule for how a leg is drawn. And so the main point that I wanna make is that deep networks have a great amount of internal structure. Uh, models do contain concept neurons, and generative models contain causal neurons that can be manipulated, and models also contain rules that relate concepts that can be rewritten. Uh, some of the rules have rank one representations that we can directly change, but there are a lot of further questions that we don't know. We don't know what is the learning process that is leading to the emergence of these complex uh, concept neurons. And if concept neurons are actually decomposing a problem into parts, we don't know if we can recompose them in new ways like modular software. And even though we can modify a few rules, we don't have ways to list out all the rules. The space of possible rules is still very big. And we don't know why some rules are learned, but not others. We don't know if there are some rules that are too hard for a network to learn. Uh, there's a lot to explore here. There's been many questions uh, that I've been able to explore by cracking open deep networks. Um, it's given me an opportunity to participate in a lot of really fascinating projects. Here are some papers uh, that, uh, that I've gotten uh, a chance to work on as part of the inquiry uh, that you can um, uh, take a look at. I'll make the slides available. Uh, when I back up and reflect about what all this research has taught me, uh, it's this. Right? Deep networks are programs without a programmer, which makes them different from regular software. We don't know what their internal goals are. We don't know why they're organized the way they are, but the neurons give us a hint that they have internal structure that is possible for us to understand. But discerning it, explaining it, it requires careful observations. It requires us to think like scientists. Uh, so I wanna thank MIT for giving me the chance to learn to think like a scientist. Uh, I've had uh, several wonderful years here. Um, it's been a few years, uh, but if you think about it in family time, it's actually been a very long time. But when I started my PhD, my youngest son, Cody, who you can see here in red on the left, was our littlest one. But now that I'm finishing, Cody is our tallest one. Uh, so for my family, dad has spent a lot of time in school, and I thank them for indulging me in all my studies for these years. Heidi and the kids have always been my bedrock support and I'm so lucky to have their love. 
Um, of course, uh, I also want to thank, oops, I want to thank my advisor, Antonio, uh, and all the mentors and friends and collaborators I've met here at MIT. I want to especially mention Junyan Zhu, uh, who arrived as a postdoc in Antonio's lab, uh, became a great collaborator. I learned a lot from him. And I learned so much from everybody in these photos, as well as many people who aren't pictured. Uh, every person here has given me inspiration, advice, support over the years. I've been really lucky to be part of this academic community. I miss uh, being at MIT very much. Uh, I, I won't have to miss it too much. I won't be far, I'll be right across the river at uh, Northeastern Corey School. So I'll look forward to future collaborations and I'll be looking for students. Uh, so with that, I wrap up my presentation and open for questions. Bravo. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, so we open the floor for questions from the audience. Just raise your hand if you wanna ask a question or, or just, yeah, Nancy. Hi, David, that was beautiful. Thank you, Nancy. Um, most neuroscientists would tell you that aside from a few categories like faces and maybe scenes and bodies, you don't really have this kind of sparse coding in the high level parts of visual cortex that most likely correspond to the, the layers you're looking at in the networks that we used to think that 30 years ago, but everybody except for Nancy has moved on. And now we understand that yes. concepts and categories are coded over million population codes over millions of neurons. So what's up with that? What's Why up with that? Networks be different? It's, it's a wonderful question. And um, so, you know, you've got people like Haxby and folks who believe in this opposite hypothesis. There's really, and I know you know this history very well, but I'll just give a little of the background. Um, there was a, you know, back, you know, 30 years ago, um, you know, people were having a lot of success at understanding what individual neurons did. And they created this manifesto they called the Neuron Doctrine, uh, which is that, you know, you can decode everything by looking at individual neurons. And the reaction to that uh, several years later was um, uh, what we call the, uh, the, the uh, dense distributed code model, uh, where you think, well, no, all the neurons must be uh, collaborating. Uh, you know, even if they are making imperceptible little signals, maybe in mass with millions of imperceptible little signals, you know, in total, the network can perceive things. And, and the typical experiment uh, that's done to, um, to support the distributed coding hypothesis is a decoding experiment. And we actually do that a lot in artificial neural networks as well, where you look at millions of neurons uh, or you know, even just thousands, and you train a classifier to say, can you tell what information all these neurons contain? Um, and uh, and, and you, it turns out by looking at enough input data, you can come to a lot of conclusions about what's there. Uh, there's this uh, very nice paper um, by, um, being Kim in the artificial neural network uh, space, where uh, where 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 they use um, they call, they call them activation vectors, and they try to answer questions like, um, is the network using a person's gender to make uh, you know some conclusion? And the way that they find evidence that it might be using the the person's gender is they decode whether that you can predict the gender from looking at all these neurons together. But there's, there's an issue with this, which is that just because the information might be present doesn't necessarily mean that that's how the network is using it. And so I think that on both sides of this debate, there are holes in the argument that just because you can decode something doesn't mean that that's actually what the network is using to decode it. Um, from, from all the experiments uh, that I've, I've done here, I, I feel like um, you know, we've had an opportunity to really play with artificial neural networks, which is um, really convenient and hard to do in uh, biological brains. And I wonder if it actually gives us a nice domain to sort of explore these questions uh, in a more complete way, instead of just sort of taking, um, uh, taking extreme positions. I feel like the truth might be somewhere in between 
the individual neuron doctrine and the fully distributed code doctrine, uh, probably something in between is closer to the truth. Yeah. Uh, I see Jerry has a question. Actually, I sort of wanted to say what you almost what you just said, which is it seemed to me that it's entirely possible that there is no contradiction between the two alternatives that were described uh, in in uh, in Nancy's question. It seems to me that there is some that it's in fact both possibly are true. That is that there is some that there is a, a coding of that sort of dense coding, and that those are very specific. Yes, yes. Now. I think that there are things that you can do um, to cause the code to be denser. So I, I showed you the experiment where we just do a random basis uh, transformation and that creates the ultimate dense code. Um, and so you certainly, you can create a network that has equivalent power and force it to be, to be dense. I think that the big mystery is why is it through or, the, sort of our ordinary training process, why do we get sparse codes? What is the learning advantage for that? There's not, I, I don't think that that's well understood. I think it's a very deep question. Um, and um, uh, and I think that, you know, if you assume that everything's a dense code, if you assume that there's no structure here, then one of the disadvantages is it doesn't really allow you to ask the question for how a sparse code might emerge or why. I think that, you know, we need to be honest and see that there are uh, sparse codes that happen and then, Use that to allow us to ask, you know, why are these things happening? Um, I, hear, so, I agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, oh, I have another question from Farron. Yes, uh, great talk. Uh, so I wanted to make a follow-up question to the first two. Yeah. Uh, on this experiment where you showed the Q and Q inverse uh, with a random... Um, yes. With a random change of basis. Yes. Uh, another experiment that could be done is kind of finding the basis that maximizes the number of, of uh, neurons that code for something without specifying which one codes for anything. This, yes. Like, uh, is, uh, and check whether you can get something that is even uh, kind of more sparse, sparser than, than the one found by the model. Yes. Uh, did you do this experiment? And if, uh, if not, do you think it could be done to improve training? I know that doing Q and then Q inverse uh, makes the forward model equivalent, but maybe it changes the dynamics of training, which is, I guess, is what partly what, what you were pointing out. Yeah, that's that's sort of my question. Um, I, I'm trying to find the slides just so that just we have context when it, we're doing it. Uh, I have done, um, I have not set up that experiment in the way that I think we could draw the conclusions um, about the question that you're asking, um, you know, in a sort of satisfactory way. I have done uh, experiments where we try to figure out how sparse the model naturally is by training, you know, optimizing a car detector and asking, you know, how many neurons do you need for a car detector? And you need surprisingly mm -hmm. few, uh, mm -hmm. but I haven't done a whole um, model uh, training to do this. One, one of the issues is that, um, I don't know if I can give you an intuition for this, but one of the issues is if you start with a vocabulary like Broden, um, you know, as big as our vocabulary was, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, actually it's quite imperfect. There are a lot of concepts that these networks are um, learning that are actually better than concepts that I've come up with by putting in this big data set of a vocabulary of a thousand things. So for example, one of the examples I, I sometimes show people is a hat neuron, right? A neuron that is not only detecting people's heads, but it's very selective to just people wearing hats and it's come up with this idea on its own. And I do not have good hat annotations in mm -hmm. Broden. There are some hats that are you know, there, but the quality is quite low. And so Broden will never find hat neurons. If I trained against Broden, it would never find hat neurons. And so I feel like if I, even if I use it as an objective, it might not actually be as helpful as what the neural network is already doing Just to uh, on clear, its own. Uh -huh. what, what, what I meant was not yep. uh, training against Broden, what mm -hmm. I meant was you still train against uh, scene classification, I believe. Yes. But uh, you, you mentioned that changing the basis, right? Make yes. the model equivalent as a forward function, right? Yes. But, yes. Uh, but the, the training dynamics made uh, the representation sparser. Yes. Um, yeah, this Q and Q inverse, perfect. Yes. And what I meant was um, maybe finding Q, like changes of basis during training such that you you can uh, find more broadening classes. Yes. Will render the, the the forward function. Yes. Equipment. Therefore, 
the accuracy on the fundamental task would be unchanged. The loss function would still be sync classification, but that's, it could ease training. That uh, that's more what I was. Uh, I, I think about. that's I think that's an excellent question. I think that's an excellent question, um, and um, it's it's the kind of experiment that uh, you know, I'd love to figure out the right way of setting it up to really explore mm -hmm. this. It's not you know it's not something that we fully understand why uh, why training dynamics works this way. Okay. Um, so yes, thank you for the question. So let's take one final question, and then we should we should move on. Okay. Um, oh, I see a question from James Gillis, one of my previous students. Hey, Hi, James. Hey, uh, this was great. This is a great talk. Uh, I was just wondering, so you were talking about um, you deleted neurons in a classifier and measured the effect that had on the output class, right? Yes, that's right. So did you find any neurons there that didn't look like anything human recognizable, right? So like a really important neuron that just correlates with nothing visible. Uh, I asked because there's some research suggesting neural networks might pick up on information that's there, but not human salient, like not human perceptible. Yeah, really strong evidence for it. Right. So I, I have to say, so, you know, when, when we look at these things, so, so the, the general answer is no. And let me show you um, uh, the results from an interesting uh, uh, experiment that we did that answers your question, if I can find, if I can find it. But the, um, uh, the answer is this, you know, you sort of ask what neurons are important, what kind of neurons emerge. Uh, are there neurons that are more meaningful or less meaningful to people? And the truth is that about, you know, half the neurons are surprisingly selective for interesting human understandable concepts. And the other half are harder for us to discern. They, they don't really line up with things that humans understand that easily. Um, and so you can kind of ask, well, uh, what's, what are the roles of these, these different kinds of units? And it turns out that if you ask, you know, what is the role of units that match human concepts really well? And how do you compare it to units that don't match human concepts really well? You see this interesting effect, which is that units that match concepts really well tend to be uh, more frequently these critical important units for these output classes. Um, and units that don't match uh, concepts uh, very well, human understandable concepts, tend to be less critical uh, for, uh, for, for output classes you know, when measured uh, in this way. So, so that, that exact question you answered, I, it, it's not that you never find um, mysterious, strange neurons. You're not really sure what they do, but you find them much less when you, when you quantify it. Great, thank you. Yep. OK, great. OK, I think that we should probably move now to to the second part or the third part where, where we join the break, breakout room, just David, Adiosha, Philip, Alexander, and we'll ask you some questions. Uh oh, great, thank you. <laughs> and then we'll come back here and for, you know, for all of you that want to stay and, and you know, celebrate or, or you know, give him the condolences for the result, uh, you know, you're welcome to stay.